Welcome back to My Smart Learning and uh, this video is designed for year 12s for the missing school obviously at the moment but if you're doing separate sciences uh, especially biology um, this might be very useful for you as well. So what we've done so far we've looked at the cardiovascular system we've looked at the heart and we've looked at the uh, cardiac output and we've looked at blood pressure um, and we've also looked at uh, haemoglobin and its function. What we're looking at today is the circulatory system. We're looking at the cardiovascular system. What's in it and why do I need one? So, quick quiz though, because we've had a few of these lessons already. I just want to see how much you can remember. So if you, after each question, if you just write down the answer, uh, press pause and then I'll go through the answers at the end. So I'm calling it the quick quiz, what we usually do, our recall PTs. But I'm calling them now quick quiz high five because if you get them all right, you get a virtual high five because we're not allowed to literally shake hands anymore or anything uh, with this coronavirus. So uh, it's going to be your virtual sterilized high five. Number one then. So name the four chambers of the heart. Press pause, write the answer down. Number two. The heart beats by itself. Now, what term do I use for that? What is the scientific or academic language we use for the fact that the heart can beat by itself? Number three, where does the stimulus start for heart to beat, for heart uh, contraction? Number four, where does it pause and restart? So the electrical activity spreads throughout the heart. There's a very slight pause and then it restarts. Uh, in the middle of the heartbeat and the last one can you remember the formula for the equation for cardiac output if you press pause just check your answers quickly and we'll go through the answers now so the four chambers of the heart then the top two chambers are called atria which is plural but you've got your right atrium and your left atrium the bottom two ventric uh, Chambers are called ventricles, so you've got your right ventricle and you've got your left ventricle. The heart beats by itself. What is the word for that? The word is myogenic. Myogenic. And we use there uh, the analogy of, I think it was Mortal Kombat, if you literally take the heart out of somebody, it will literally carry on beating in your hands because the heart is myogenic. It does beat by itself. Why does it beat by itself? Well, the stimulus starts in the right atrium there is a, a bunch of cells, they're specialized cells, uh, twitch fibers basically, twitch cells that sort of fire these little electrical impulses uh, rhythmically, and it's known as the sinoatrial node. The sinoatrial node, or if you use the uh, abbreviation, S-A-N, S-A-N in capitals. Now that spreads throughout the top of the chambers of the heart, causing the contraction of the atria, forcing the blood down, and there is a very slight pause. Where is that pause? Right in the middle of the, the heart, there is another node called the atrioventricular node, the AVN, the AVN. And remember, there's a, it passes on, I use that analogy of the relay race, it passes it on, and then the electrical activity continues down the bundle of his. So that's the atrioventricular node. And the formula for cardiac output is stroke volume, times by the heart rate. The stroke volume times heart rate. So cardiac output is equal to stroke volume times the heart rate. If you got five out of five, you get a virtual high five. Now, the transport system. What are, what, why do we need transport systems? Can you just do a quick little mind map, your brainstorm, of some of the needs, why do we need a transport system within the body? Why do we need the blood to pump around the body? Can you write down some uh, reasons and some features of a transport system? So if I give you five minutes to have a go at that, press pause, try it for five minutes and see if you can get some of these. Now continue on. So what features do we have in these mass transport systems? We're not just talking about animals here, we'll be talking a little bit about plants too. So it's also known as mass transport or bulk transport. So in plants, water needs to pass through them. In, in mammals, it's blood. 
So blood has to be pumped all around your body. Why? Because that blood is carrying cells, your red blood cells, your white blood cells. It's carrying uh, cell fragments, like platelets. And it's also carrying dissolved nutrients. So there'll be uh, carbon dioxide dissolved in there, which is the waste products. So there'll be waste products like urea and carbon dioxide, excess water. You also need the water, which is useful. And it's also carrying useful products, uh, mineral, mineral ions, um, glucose, and oxygen and hemoglobin. So all of those useful materials need to be transferred to every single cell of the body. So we need that to be transported around to every single cell. And we need to get the waste products to the places where we can excrete them. So we can excrete the carbon dioxide out of our lungs. We can get rid of urea via our kidneys. So we call it our internal medium. So medium is just another word for a material, a substance. So it's an internal medium, it dissolves all the substance that we talked about. Now to transfer that medium, we need uh, tubes. Our tubes are known as blood vessels. So but it needs to be a closed system, so it's not leaking out, squirting out everywhere. Um, and we need a mechanism of making sure that, that uh, the medium, that blood, our internal medium, can be moved from one place to another place. And for that to happen, because it's a fluid, there needs to be a pressure gradient. And to make that pressure gradient, we've got a pump. And that pump, as you know, is known as your heart. Now, two ways then. So in animals, it's the muscular contractions of our heart that we just said. But in plants though, it's more of a passive process. It's the evaporation of water from the leaves and the osmosis of water getting into the plants through the roots. But we'll come on to transpiration and translocation in a later video. Mass flow though needs to be in one direction and it needs to, in, in mammals especially, it needs to go uh, from one place to another place and it must make sure it doesn't go back the way it came. So to prevent that we've got valves and you need to be able to control the flow rate, the speed at which it flows. If it flows too fast, it can be a problem. If it flows too slow, it can be a problem. So you need to, and, and depending on the situation uh, and the circumstances. So for instance, if you need to uh, cool down, you need more blood to flow closer to the extremity, to, to your surfaces, you can have vasodilation. So you can have muscular contractions and muscular dilations, mus muscular relaxations, so to allow blood to flow to the places where you want more blood to flow. So if you're blushing, your blood will flow to your face. If you're uh, overheating, you'll get blood going closer to your extremities. If you're very cold, the blood will constrict, you get vasoconstriction and blood will stay closer to the core. If you just had a huge Sunday lunch and uh, the last thing you want to do is go out for a run, then the blood, you, you get very, very tired. Why? Because less of the blood is flowing to your muscles. So it's not going to your skeletal muscles. It will be going more directed towards your uh, digestive tract the digestive system because it's trying to absorb as much of that uh, digested food as possible. And we also need a movement of the external medium too. So for instance for fish obviously it's water, water flows over the gills. For mammals, land living mammals, we need uh, oxygen to enter our lungs. So the external medium is the air, so the air needs to move in and out of our lungs so that the oxygen can get into our blood. We need that movement of the, the mechanism of ventilation just so that we can replenish that air so we can get a higher concentration of oxygen so we can maintain that gradient. And it will always link back to fixed law. So if you've been in our previous lessons, fixed law is the rate of diffusion is proportional to the concentration gradient multiplied by the surface area divided by the length of the diffusion pathway. That just basically means how thick that surface is for that diffusion to occur. So you want to have a massive surface area, you want to have a huge concentration gradient, so you want one place where it's very, very high and concentrated, and one place where it's very, very low. And for that to occur, you need the constant movement of the internal medium, the blood taking the oxygen away from the lungs, and you want the external medium to also be moving so that the oxygen is coming in, or the air is coming in with the oxygen and you're breathing out the expelled air. But you want to constantly bring in fresh oxygen so you have a high concentration of oxygen from the air and very, very low in the blood. 
So our cardiovascular system then. We've looked at the heart in detail. You can watch one of the previous videos. But where does this blood flow? So blood will come back to the heart via the veins. Now the blood is never ever ever blue. And this is one of the misconceptions. And your veins are never ever blue. It's another misconception. But you say, oh look, look at my skin, it looks green. Why does my veins look green? But this is an optical illusion. Your light, just like why is the sea blue, light waves, you've got Richard of York gave battle in vain, red, orange, yellow, green, blue, indigo, violet. So the white light is a mixture of the seven colours. And what happens is the light will get absorbed and some of it will be reflected back to your eyes. And that's the colours that you're seeing that's being reflected back to your eyes. But they're not actually that colour. The reason why you see these colours in textbooks is just purely for graphical reasons, just so that you can tell the difference between the red side and the blue side. So you know that this side is the deoxygenated blood and this side is the oxygenated blood. But blood will return to the heart via the veins. But let's just say the heart contracts and the blood, it's a simultaneous contraction because there's two pumps. So when it squeezes, some of the blood from your pulmonary artery will go to the lungs. That's the pulmonary artery there. There's a mistake on this diagram. <laughs> That's funny. Right, so you've got the main vein, which is the vena cava, coming to here. You've got the pulmonary, this should be the pulmonary artery, it's been labelled the wrong way around here. The pulmonary artery here goes to the lungs and then the pulmonary vein brings the blood oxygenated blood back to the heart and then when it gets pumped out of the aorta it will go to all the organs in your body now if we just move on so there's three types of blood vessels though the three types of blood vessels are your arteries your veins and your capillaries so what do the arteries look like the arteries have these different layers there's four layers there's a tough outer layer which has to withstand the pressure from outside and anything from the uh, inside mostly from the inside because the blood pressure causes the blood uh, to force the blood outwards you've got two linings in the inside it's got muscular layer and it's got elastic fibers in there and in the artery it's very 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 thick why because it has to withstand that pressure now if you remember back from the previous lesson previous lesson you got 120 millimeters of mercury when it's the systolic pressure when the heart uh, contracts squeezing the blood outwards and it needs to withstand that pressure so it doesn't rupture and it's got those elastic fibers to have that give because if the pipes these tubes were solid just like pipes in your radiator pipes at home if it was solid if you leave your house over the winter let's say you go on holiday and you switch off your central heating system and it freezes overnight the water in the pipes can freeze and what happens to when water freezes the well, water expands and as it expands it can cause uh, forces on the pipes and then that force can cause the pipes to split it can crack them when the water defrosts and then you can have a huge flood in your house so same thing with blood you don't want your blood vessels rupturing because you get internal bleeding and you die so in in arteries the muscular layers are very thick and the elastic fibers are very thick so they can withstand that pressure. You need those muscles as well so they can constrict and what they do is they can divert blood to other places or other areas of the body that needs more blood like we talked about earlier or what it can do is it can increase the flow in particular areas as well. And so that's the inner layers there and then you've got another layer on the inside called the endothelium. So endothelium. And the endothelium is one thin layer on the inside and it's very, very, very smooth. Why? So it allows the, the, the blood to flow very, very smoothly. You don't want turbulence in the blood. If there's turbulence and friction for the blood, it makes it harder for the heart to beat, to pump that blood through the arteries. And also with the turbulence, you can get blood cells, red blood cells sticking together, forming these blood clots known as thrombosis or thrombus. Okay, you can get with thrombosis, which can end up blocking the coronary arteries and leading to a heart attack. So you've got blood flowing through those. So the four layers then, we've got the tough outer layer, fibrous layer. You've got the thick muscular layer with the uh, fibrous, sorry, the elastic fibers. And you've got the endothelium as well. 
The lumen then, the lumen is the hole that you see in the middle. And the lumen in an artery is relatively small. And thereby, the smaller the area, the higher the pressure that it can maintain. So it's got a small uh, lumen. Now the arteries, the largest artery in your body is called the aorta. And the aorta arches over and then they keep branching out and getting smaller and smaller and smaller. Okay, so um, the arteries need that they do not have valves. They don't need to have valves because the pressure is so high they can transfer the blood very far distances. So you don't need to have any valves because valves are there to prevent uh, backflow. And you've got this stretch to allow the uh, pressure not to cause any damage. The veins then, so you've got arteries in the middle of the capillaries and then the capillaries will end up backing back to the veins. But the arteries do get smaller and smaller and smaller. So you start with the largest one, which is the aorta. After the aorta, they branch off into large arteries and you get smaller arteries and they get very, very small arteries called arterioles. Same structure, just that you've got the, the muscular walls and the elastic fibers get much thinner. So they start to get, uh, because the pressure starts to drop. So after the arterioles, you get capillaries, and then after capillaries, you get venules, which are very, very small veins, and then you end up with the veins. So the veins then, you've got much thinner walls. You've still got that tough outer layer, but on the inside, the important layers there, you've got muscular, you've got the muscle tissues, and you've got the elastic fibers, but they're much, much thinner. Why are they much thinner? Because the pressure is very, very low. So they don't need to withstand this high pressure anymore. And because of that, the pressure starts to drop, the blood would start to pool and it wouldn't go anywhere. And that's dangerous. So, and to prevent that blood, uh, stop the backflow of blood, you've got valves. You get valves inside veins. Now, the lumen is much larger. Because these lay layers are such so thin, the lumen is much, much, much larger and because of that low pressure. So, what about the capillaries? The capillaries are much simpler. They are just one cell layer thick. So it is just literally like the endothelium. In the veins also, we have an endothelium, just like the, the arteries. We've got the four layers. We've got the top outer layer, you've got the muscular layer, and you've got the elastic layer, fibers, and you've got the endothelium. The endothelium is just what the capillaries are. The capillaries are so small, so microscopic, that you have one cell layer thick, just an endothelium. And there's gaps between each of those cells. Those gaps allow the uh, white blood cells to come out. So they can actually squeeze out and um, uh, they can go out and carry on with their function. But also liquids can leak out. But the fact that it's one cell layer thick allows the diffusion of substances to pass out. So useful substances go out and waste products can go from around the tissues and back into the blood much quicker because it's one cell layer thick. And we talked about it in fixed law, the bottom of that uh, formula, it's the length of the diffusion pathway. They're very, 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 very thin. So the diffusion pathway is very, very, very short so that things can diffuse more rapidly. And to allow more time for oxygen, for instance, to get into the blood cells, this lumen is so small, the diameter of the lumen is approximately the same size of roughly to a red blood cell, which is extremely, extremely small. So red blood cells have to literally go through one, in, in a row, one by one, um, and the, the edges of the red blood cells, so if you imagine you're walking through a corridor and the corridor is so narrow and your shoulders are touching from wall to wall, you can't run really fast through there anymore. So you have to literally just squeeze your way through. And red blood cells are doing the same thing here. They are literally flexing a little bit so they can bend the shoulders in a little bit and squeeze their way through in a row so that it slows the blood right down so it's giving more time for exchange to occur. Useful stuff to go out from the blood to the cells and then the waste products go from the cells back into the blood. So the capillaries there are the link between the arteries and the veins and that's where the exchange is occurring. So if we were comparing them, you can see the difference. So this is your artery, much, much thicker and the veins are much, much thinner, a much larger lumen, a lot smaller lumen in the uh, artery. Now, if we look at the veins though, 
the veins have, if you do a cross section through them, have these valves and they're to prevent backflow. So as blood goes through them, it will try to fall back down because the pressure is very low. But to stop that, these valves will snap back shut and keep the blood at that level there. But then how do I get the blood back to the heart? Well, it's to do with muscle contractions. If you are lying in a bed for days on end and you didn't move, you'd end up getting bed sores and you'd also get, you know, get bruising all around your body and stuff. Because if you're not moving, the blood can't move back to the heart. The blood has to continually move around, 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 around. It's called circulation. And if you get on a long haul flight, one of the things that might happen, the air, air cabin crew would give you the safety instructions, obviously, if, if you've got a crash, oxygen masks come down and these are your exits, whatever you. But one of the other things they mention is that you should regularly, every hour or so, get out of your seat and go for a walk. Why? I thought they might ask you to wear these special type of socks called compression socks and you sometimes wear them when you're having an operation. Why? It's to prevent blood clots. But why do you get blood clots? You get things called thrombosis. If the blood sits around for in one place for too long, the blood red blood cells can end up sticking, making these little clots called a thrombus. And that thrombus can leave, lead to something called deep vein thrombosis. And some people have come off flights and then after even two, three days later, after they've been on this long haul flight, have died because this blood clot has ended up getting stuck in the coronary arteries and causing a heart attack. So well, how do I get that blood back then? It's a little bit like when we talk about peristalsis, when you squeeze, 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 and we get the toothpaste to the top. A little bit similar to that where muscles are always moving. And if muscle, even when you're asleep, in, you know, sleep all night, you're not sleeping in the same position all night, you actually do move during the night. So tossing and turning, what's happening? The muscles are squeezing on your veins and though that squeezing is causing the blood to move through so if you look at this one here it's not moving and that muscle contracts it squeezes the blood up and then when it relaxes the blood tries to fall back down but it can't because of the valves snap back shut and that's how blood will eventually get back to your heart through your vena cava so if i did a cross section then again through the arteries veins and capillaries you can see the difference in the size of the lumen and the, the, the thickness of those layers. And these are capillaries, and this is where the exchange will happen. So if that's been useful, make sure you like, and then you subscribe, and then share. And recall that at the end of this lesson, because it's just focusing on just the differences between arteries, veins, and capillaries. And uh, what you can do is you can see this is a capillary bed, so the blood comes through the arteries. We're going to go into this in more detail in our next video, looking at how the exchange and diffusion occurs and how we make something called tissue fluid. That's coming in the next video. What you can do is draw a table to summarise what you know about the arteries, veins and capillaries. If you press pause, fill in the table and I'll quickly go through the answers, see what you've learnt from this particular lesson. So if you've done that, what we should have for the function of these guys, so the arteries function is the blood is pumped away from the heart, the vein pumps, uh, brings blood back towards the heart. The capillaries is where the exchange happens. You've got the different layers. With the arteries and the veins, you've got the same layers. You've got the outer tough layer, you've got elastic and you've got muscle fibers and you've got those endothelium, exactly the same. The difference is though, that the arteries, these guys are much thicker, much thinner in the veins, but the capillaries are just one cell thick. The lumen is relatively small in an artery, L veins is much larger compared to the artery, but the capillaries are microscopic. So they're about, they're about micro, they're microscopic, it's about the same width of a red blood cell. Uh, so we're talking about the micron size. The valves, arteries, no, they don't have any valves. They don't need to because there's high pressure there. The veins do have valves. Why? Because the pressure is very low. The blood will go back. Capillaries don't have any valves because they're too small, for instance, but the pressure is relatively low there too. So, yeah, if this has been useful for you, if you uh, like, subscribe and share, uh, I hope to see you on the next video, which will be about tissue fluid. Look after yourselves.